Hi Robin. Hi, how are you doing? So how have you found conference this weekend? Oh, I've really enjoyed it so far. It's fantastic to see so many people. Uh, I think the venue's good, everyone's quite together and it's quite nice to have everyone. It's nicer, like the more you get involved, the more people you meet. So, so have you been national organiser for a wee while? Uh, just since November, so I joined the party um, after the 2017 general election, so it's been quite fast, my introduction to Young Scots for Independence, but it's been good, I've enjoyed it. And how do you find um, your engagement with young people? What, what do you want to do to try and get more people involved in politics? Well, right now we're trying to run a campaign, getting our elected members to um, give us a wee quote and a graphic to go with it to suggest what they've gained from campaigning and how it's benefited them because we're wanting more young people to show up to campaign days. We're feeling like that's where we're struggling, getting getting the bodies on the ground and the boots on the ground to go chap doors and leaflet because that's what really makes a difference in election time. So has there been anything this, camp, this um, weekend that you've had particular interest in? Yes, well yesterday morning I proposed uh, the Young Scots for Independence resolution on a school weavers toolkit which is just based on providing more life skills for Scotland school weavers. When they leave schools they'll be provided with financial education, education on our democracy and more information on the things they're going to need like how to write a CV and cover letter, the things that they're really going to need when they turn into adults. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much for talking with us today, Robin. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi, how you doing? Good. How have you found conference this weekend? It's been a really exciting conference actually this weekend. I think it's important to note this kind of idea of kind of hope and aspiration. It's something that's been missing from British politics for quite a while now actually. And I think for me personally this conference has really reignited that feeling within me and made me really eager and, and ambitious to go on and, and fight the next independence referendum when that kicks off. And how do you think you, you can get more young people involved in politics? Well I think, you know, just now politics is perhaps more interesting than it's ever been. It's a great time for young people to be involved in politics and to make their views heard. Um, I mean, right now the, the views and, and I suppose futures of young people are under threat and it's really important actually that the young people become politically involved and make their voices heard. In terms of how we do that, I think it's about making it accessible to young people, making it interesting. And I think the SNP is very good at that and I think you know, we're, we're very good at having encouraging and uh, exciting debates and discussions and I think that has to continue, definitely. So is there anything in particular this weekend, either the speeches or resolutions or whatever that you've found particularly interesting? Yeah, well the YSI had one resolution on the agenda this year at conference, it was our, our motion on the School Leaders Toolkit. We were delighted to see that pass um, on, on the conference floor. Um, but there's been a number of resolutions obviously um, at conference this year. We had the, the currency debate yesterday which was exciting definitely. Um, and I think, you know, just these kind of broader discussions that we're having on the future of Scotland and, and the Scotland that we want to, to create is really exciting actually, definitely. Okay, great. So thanks for joining us today. Day, John, no that's been great. Hi, Caitlin. Hiya. So, how have you found a conference this weekend? Oh, it's been great. Um, this is my first conference in Edinburgh. Um, I've been to a couple before in the past, but this is definitely a different feel to it. Um, I found it a lot more intimate. You know, you see a lot more people and you get to know a lot more people when it's on the smaller scale. So, I've enjoyed that part of it. Is there anything this weekend that you've found of particular interest? You know, the resolutions or the speeches? Is there anything that's kind of really resonated with you? Um, for me, definitely, um, there was a topical moved by Tommy Shepherd and seconded by Hannah Rodell on the climate strikes that, um, that young people across the world have been taking part in. Um, and I was lucky enough to get picked to speak in support of that motion. Um, I, I, along with um, a lot of my colleagues in the YSI, the, the youth wing of the, the party, um, have been taking part in the strikes. Um, so that's something that I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to speak on as it's, it's an, an issue that's really, really close to my heart. So, so in terms of climate change, what, what can you do to get more people aware and more people interested? I think, I mean, especially as the YSI, as the young people, all we can do is encourage people to, more and more people to go, to, the, to go along to the strikes and to take part in the direct action that's been going on. Um, and not necessarily, you know, with the specific groups that have been doing things, but just generally. Um, and just a lot of social media as well to tweet out and say, you know, I support this, like we call on the government to declare a climate emergency, all sorts of things like that. So, so do you think, um, I mean, there seems to have been quite a shift in the last couple of weeks, just in terms of young people getting, but obviously the, the downside is, you know, they've, they've been slated for missing school or missing university and stuff, but, but do you think that there, there has to be a key message there that, that means that, you know, people are, are willing to do that just to be able to get, because sometimes you've got to do things to get the, the publicity. No, 100%. As I said yesterday in my speech, you know, for as long as the, the, the debate is centred around, you know, should they be missing school rather than what action can we take? the answer to that first question will continue to be yes um, and it's something that you know 
is like young people are con continuing to strike and it's not going to stop and it is something that we need action and we need action now and we're lucky in Scotland that you know the, Scot the SNP Scottish government it is leading the way we're on a world stage in terms of climate change but in Scotland we will continue to strike to lobby the Westminster government to up their game like on par to the Scottish government. Great thanks very much Caelan and good luck with the campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Ty Ronnie. How are you doing? How have you found conference this weekend? I thoroughly enjoyed it. Conference can be some quite dry sometimes. Yesterday the debate in Kearns, I think grabbed everybody's imagination. It was great. We've got such an open, honest and inclusive discussion about that. So yesterday went very, very well. This morning I've been doing something about the Scottish Statistics Agency and I'm now off to host my own event on drug policy reform. So do you want to tell us a bit more about your, your um, fringe that you're holding? It's a look at drug policy reform and basically asking yourself a question, how has it worked, has it not worked? So I brought two excellent speakers. I, I'm a great believer in going back to the experts and talking to them rather than politicians just continuing to, to voice their own. So we've got Neil Woods, who's from the United Kingdom Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, Neil was an ex-undercover police cop for 14 years. He walked to walk and talked to talk, put his life in the line to prosecute big drug dealers. And at the end of his career, he looked back at it and said, not only did I not do any good, I've actually done damage here, and he's been brave enough and big enough to stand up and say that. Written an excellent book called Good Cop, Bad War, and along with Jaisra Ferry of the Drug Wars. And I've also got Fiona Gilberson from Recovering Justice, who've been much more involved with the, the process of getting people who have been fallen to a, a drug addiction or, or, or misuse of drugs, and helping those people re-establish their lives and communities. Would it be right in saying, Ronnie, that you have been campaigning for this for a wee while and you come from the angle of a, more of a health issue than a criminal issue? Absolutely. We've persecuted people for using drugs for since 1971, Misuse of Drugs Act. And that was an all-encompassing model which put things like marijuana and cannabis or derivatives of and also scooped up cocaine and heroin. Now, people now have got very specific views as to what those things are. And yet alcohol is a psychiatric substance and it's accepted. It's not just accepted socially, it's encouraged socially. We have weddings, christings, funerals, people drink alcohol. But if someone wrote up a joint, people were running through the doors going, well that's a bad drug. And it's from misconception. And I'm not saying everybody should take drugs. What I'm saying is if somebody wants to take a drug, they have to know what's in that drug. And what remains in the hands of the drug dealers, if you're buying some kids are going to concerts or, or raves, what they're called these days, and they want to dance all night, to help them do that, they would buy a wee blue tablet. That blue tablet can kill them, because they've got no idea what's in it. So I'm not saying we should all take drugs, but if people want to, they have to know what's in it, what's queens come from, and if, if something goes wrong, how do we chase it back to the source so we stop more people from dying through it? So this idea of persecuting people, it has to be about helping support and education. Good. So is there anything in this conference that's particularly stuck out for you? Any of the speeches or the resolutions or anything? I thought my speech was excellent. <laughs> Apart from your own. Um, I said, the the full-hearted way we took on the currency issue, which some quarters will want to see as a divide in the party, but I think we can come here to the conference and discuss that so openly. We got one amendment through, personally I debate others as well, but to have a party policy, a party conference where we can still come and do that, puts paid to the lie that we're some sort of board moving and thinking as one. Uh, we're continually re-evaluating who we are and what we are and the Scotland we want to define for an independent country that we're going to be. Perfect. Thanks very much for joining us, Ronnie. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Welcome, Susan. Hi. So how have you found conference this weekend? It's been great. I love conference. I think uh, it's my favourite thing about being in the SNP. I think conference is the most fun you can have as a member of the SNP. Um, so I, I'm a, uh, always a, an enthusiastic conference attender. And is there anything particular in this weekend, either yesterday or today, that's kind of stood out for you? Is there anything you've been particularly interested in? I think the debate yesterday on um, our economic plan for an independent Scotland was a really, really good debate. Really strong, really, you know, some great speeches, really in-depth. Um, and it demonstrated uh, the, the confidence that we have as a party to be able to have these debates in public, among ourselves, in a respectful, democratic way. Um, I think the outcome uh, was was good. Um, we we have, I think, an incredibly strong economic plan uh, that will start from day one of an independent Scotland, which will be about creating an inclusive economy um, that will help to transform uh, the life chances of Scots who have been left behind by the Unionist parties. So, what would you say to the opposition parties that, that keep telling everybody that there's no appetite for independence? Well, I think one look at the polls um, suggests that that is absolutely not the case. Um, as people see the 
uh, UK in meltdown as they see the absolute disaster that the Westminster political classes um, are causing, not just in Scotland, but right across the UK. Um, more and more people are coming to the view that um, independence is the way for Scotland, A, to get out of this mess, uh, the mess that's being created by Westminster, but also more importantly to create our own path and make our own decisions and not have this kind of stuff imposed on us ever again. That's great Susan, thanks very much for joining us, enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi Gavin. Hi, how are you doing? So how have you found the conference this weekend? Yeah, it's been absolutely great, um, you know, just um, really great debate, good resolutions, um, as obviously as the YSI convener I'm absolutely delighted that we passed our resolution which is calling for uh, the Scottish Government to adopt a, a policy from New Zealand uh, called the School Leavers Toolkit. Um, which basically is going to the idea is to try and train Scotland's young people to be uh, financially li literate, uh, to be good kind of civic, um, in, you know, good at engaging um, civically, uh, and to be good active voters and participants in society. So I, that passed with a wee bit of a there was going to be a, re, there was a wee remit, a wee remit back in, uh, which failed. So there's a wee bit of a uh, interest there, but you know, massive support across. The board. So what does the YSI need to do to encourage more young people to get involved in politics? I mean, we do it day in, day out by, I mean, by re first of all, we, once people actually get, get involved in the SNP, we reach into the branches and get them involved in the YSI. The YSI is growing rapidly. We have hundreds and hundreds of active members and we have a huge, huge team at this conference, um, you know, doing everything from organising, you know, stuff like our conference karaoke, um, passing them great resolutions and stuff like that. Um, but aside from that, um, that's a big question for reaching out with the party and that's something I think a lot, uh, I think quite often on actually, um, for how we do that. Um, we are trying to reach out to the wider independence movement to encourage people to actually just join the party and get involved in party politics as well. So to that end we will be attending stuff like the uh, upcoming marches, giving out our leaflets, making sure that people know what the YSI is and know that the, know that the SMB has an incredibly active and organised youth wing. So is there anything this weekend that you've particularly enjoyed or been a particular interest to you? Well, we had our SMB conference karaoke last night, which um, I am suffering from today. Um, and then we passed our resolution yesterday, which is definitely the highlight so far. We had two great speeches from two young women in the party um, who were obviously massively well received. Um, and actually there was a wee um, point of ordering um, because we've got in the habit now of our resolutions are always before lunchtime. So the whole, that whole starts emptying out when we, we start speaking. So I, a guy came in and did a point of order saying that needs to stop happening to the YSI. And, um, there was, you know, a standing ovation from the audience almost. So yeah, yeah it's been a lot of high points. That's great. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the conference, Gavin. Sure Hi, Michelle. How have you found conference this weekend? Great. Uh, I've enjoyed the the amount of people here is quite something. I mean, when you go into the hall and the size of it and the energy and the passion and enthusiasm is, is quite remarkable. And in the public areas as well, there's a constant stream of people that you, it takes you 10 minutes to get from A to B. There's so many people that want to stop and chat to you. And that's fantastic. It gives everyone a real burst to be together and united around a common cause. So is there anything this weekend from from the agenda that you find particularly interesting? Well for me, I mean as you can imagine, and it won't be any surprise, the discussion around the Growth Commission and currency and so on. Now I appreciate there's a whole range of strong feelings about that and it was a very, very varied uh, debate, but I was pleased at the way that people felt able to make their voices heard, put their points of view across, and then there was a whole succession of votes. Now some people will be happy, some people will be unhappy, but we have to remember that's the whole point of these conferences, that people can make their voices heard not just you know at the front of the program it says Scotland makes Scotland's voice heard but people within the SNP have also got to make their voices heard so I found that both interesting from a content point of view and from the way a conference should operate as well. And what do you say to the opposition who tell us there's no appetite for independence? Tosh. <laughs> I tell that's what I say to them you walk in here and feel the energy and if anything people are even more resolute than I've seen at any time before the genie is totally and truly out of the bottle absolutely an appetite big time and it's getting bigger it's fantastic that's great Michelle thanks for joining us this thank afternoon you. thank you and hi Roger how have you found conference this weekend yeah, I think the mood's been very good, very positive. People are looking forward very much to the coming referendum. 
think the expectations are it will probably be sometime next year and uh, uh, people I think are really getting ready to go out there and campaign for independence. And obviously, you know, even your time in Westminster and afterwards, you've done quite a bit in terms of work around Brexit and stuff. What, what's your kind of feeling of what's happening there? If there's as anybody that knows what's happening in Brexit. Well, I wish I could say that people were. I remember coming down and talking in your patch about a year and a half ago uh, uh, about the research we were doing. And at that time, I was saying what we detected was not only was there uncertainty, but there was the feeling of chaos right? and uh, uh, we uh, discussed a bit of that and I would have thought in 18 months surely that chaos would have declined a bit but if anything it's worse and people think it is such chaotic times you've got a completely dysfunctional UK government and you've also got a completely dysfunctional main opposition party uh, both of them kind of limping towards and want some kind of Brexit, despite what the views of people might be now, now that they've had time to reflect. So the whole Westminster system is in complete chaos. I mean, uh, uh, I, I was reminded, I, I mentioned it yesterday when I, uh, uh, I gave a wee speech, I was reminded recently of the words of uh, uh, Gore Vidal. Uh, uh, about the way in, and reflecting on the way in which this UK government is surviving by having grubby deals with the DUP and he once said that our form of democracy is bribery and really in truth that is what's holding the UK government together is sheer blatant bribery to try and get sufficient support to hang on to such power and, and so that I think the whole thing is, is, is Politically, we're in very dangerous times. It is utterly chaotic. And so uh, the one thing that really I think is very reassuring is how united the movement is. And I use the term the movement advisedly. Although we've had, although there will always be differences and there will always be a lively debate, that's a good thing. But I think overall, the movement is very focused on we have to put this proposition to the people of Scotland. We have to give them a way not only to escape from the horrors of the chaotic UK system, but we need them to be able to build a kind of society that people can feel uh, they are really part of, and that they own, and that they can shape, and that future generations can be proud of. And do you think, um, you know, obviously the, the conference, is there anything sort of like actually stood out for you this weekend? Is there anything particular that you kind of thought well, that was been really interesting. Or that was really good. I think. I think for me, the most interesting thing has not been any of the speakers or any of the speeches as such. It's been the way in which uh, the dozens and dozens of delegates that I've talked to uh, want to engage in conversations and want to really engage in the future. And that's why I think there's a lot of excitement about the proposition that Joanna Cherry was talking about about citizens' assemblies. Uh, I've shortly got a thing being published about what I think should be done in the aftermath of a referendum, uh, a yes referendum, how we need to keep engaging with people and how we do that. Because I think people want to be, they want a democracy where they're able to engage. They don't expect to dictate what's going to happen, but they expect to have a voice and they, 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 expect to have, they want to have different places in which that voice can be heard. And so I think that's one of the most healthy things about this. I think it's a conference that's giving all the uh, uh, mood music of we want to keep participating. That's great, Roger. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Hi, Greg. How have you found conference this weekend? Magic. <laughs> Th thoroughly enjoying it. There's a buzz about the place. It was inevitable because of what Nicola said earlier on this week and the opponents of independence will try their very, very best to spin it, spin it in negative ways. But you know, can I just put it this way, um, after she had made her statement earlier on this week, I went on to Twitter and one of the first comments I saw was from a punter in Glasgow, uh, a woman who tweets occasionally, doesn't say too much, and uh, her response to it was, uh, oh, you know, I should always practice these lines before I say it. What's, what's the one that, uh, that, that um, you, you speak 
to the device and uh, uh, it has a woman's name on it. I've really blown this one, haven't I? You, you, you have these Amazon things. And she just asked for it to play Caledonia. And, and you know, at that point I thought, just wanting to hear Caledonia song, it really struck at my, my heart at that point. The, um, I, I think the mood in here is one that uh, it's optimism, determination, as you would expect. But there's a smile on people's faces more than you sometimes see. Uh, we know that we're going places and we know that we're going to do it. So what's the, the trade union group been up to you know, now? What, what are their plans for the future? We uh, have been active in a couple of fronts. Um, they, campaigning for independence and uh, doing the day job. Let's talk about the day job. The, uh, we, we had a, uh, actually had a fringe meeting yesterday uh, which had uh, representatives from Scottish Hazards, so had uh, Patrick Maguire, who's the legal advisor to them, uh, and uh, we had uh, Chris Stevens, who's a parliamentary spokesman uh, at Westminster and these kind of issues, uh, Chris Stevens MP. Uh, and uh, with Lynn Henderson, a, a YES supporter, who also just happens to have recently been the president of the STUC, uh, and she's standing for a senior, uh, senior position in the PCS union. Anyway, what we were talking about was corporate homicide. Hey, isn't that a strange subject to suddenly be talking about? But that's where ordinary people get treated badly at a dangerous place of work, and they die. And the big businesses which make a fortune out of the poorly run businesses um, you know, with dangerous practices. They make a profit and they don't suffer a consequence. But you know what? We've been told by Westminster we don't have the power to legislate for that in Scotland and we are going to challenge that. And that's what our, uh, our meeting was about yesterday, organising to make sure that Scots have a right to protect themselves against the atrocious treatment by, by greedy big bosses. That's one side, that's getting on with the day job. Uh, the thing we're accused of not doing by our opponents, fascinating because in Westminster, by the way, do you know how much legislation there is going on? Just now, you know the answer. How much legislation is going through Westminster other than Brexit? Big fat zero. They, are not, they don't have a day job, they only have the Brexit job. Uh, so we're doing all these other things. But uh, the other things at the conference, the, uh, uh, the TUG um, also was very active in trying to persuade people on the resolutions that came up yesterday in the Sustainable Growth Commission. And uh, everybody has their take on different aspects of it. I think the party has very strongly united around the slightly tweaked position at the end where, yes, we accept we're not going to have a new currency on day one. But you know what? We won't, don't want to wait until day 10,000 or whatever for it either. Uh, so it will be in a very short period of time. That's the this, this small tweak that we made to it and it was agreed by, by the conference. It was a happy day. Uh, we were happy inside the conference. And I think a lot of the people we must work with closely to win independence outside the conference, I know they were happy too. Very good day. And you're also involved in the Scottish Independence Foundation. What, what's been happening with them recently? Uh, we've uh, we've got to a wonderful position. We've spent uh, not spent. We've given out more than eighty thousand pounds since we were formed. It's just over a year since we we gave out our first grant. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, we, we've arranged things by getting people to to sponsor to to donate for specific overheads like office and uh, other admin issues. Uh, so that we don't spend any money on that whatsoever uh, from our funds that our ordinary donors give to us. 100% of donations coming in from our ordinary donors go back out again to grassroots level. Uh, I'm now uh, in communication with our 88th applicant uh, looking for funding for grassroots support uh, and you're seeing it all across the country. There are some wonderful projects where uh, people who just needed a wee bit of seed corn fund, a wee bit of pump priming to get themselves going, uh, to get a banner, to get a stall, to get a gazebo, to buy some leaflets or, or whatever, organise events. They're all doing that. And you know what? That means that throughout the country we've got groups dotted everywhere, not just getting ready to start campaigning for independence, they've hit the streets, it started. So finally, is there, is there anything this weekend that's really stood out for you that you've been really interested in? I've got a time machine uh, and I've just looked ahead for a couple of hours and the thing which has stood out for me is Nicola's address which she's going to make at the end of the day. I uh, wish you had a time machine too. <laughs> it's a stormer of a speech because it's been well trailed this morning and it's going to set us uh, in the right mood for independence. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, Greg.
Ruth, how have you found conference this weekend? It's been brilliant. I'm just buzzing with it. The highlight for me was seeing the um, uh, Emma Harper MSP and uh, Deirdre Brock MPs motions for protecting uh, Scotland's PGI, Protected Geographic Indicators. Scotland's brand is hugely important, not only to our economy, but to our communities. It is of massive significance to, to see to see uh, the SNP conference taking on board a huge grassroots movement and then looking really understanding what that means to food standards and, and to, to farming and to our economy. It was, uh, to see that that's now policy, uh, was, uh, that made my day. Today, for me, uh, I've had two big highlights, uh, one of which is the Citizens' Assemblies, which I think is really significant. I think in order for democracy truly to function, you have to involve people at the grassroots. You can't just have top-down edicts coming. And I think that for the Scottish Government to take on board people of all perspectives, regardless of your political outlook, you can be a part of the Citizens' Assembly. That's how democracy really should work. And, and as a former peace camper many years ago, it's hard to tell perhaps now, but many years ago, when I was about 19 years old, I was a wee peace camper, a skinhead peace camper, sitting in the mud outside Greenham in a fast lane. Uh, and I have spent a little time at Her Majesty's pleasure, but it was in a good cause. And to see, finally, it coming on to SNP policy and, and good on the folks who were speaking, it was magnificent speeches this morning, uh, talking about why we should get rid of nuclear weapons, not only because they're weapons of mass destruction and almost certainly illegal under international law, but because having nuclear weapons beside Glasgow, I mean, having nuclear weapons in, beside one of the, the Scotland's uh, most populous cities is it, utter madness. And you've got the nuclear convoys, which many people don't realise. There's a If you go online, you'll find a group called Convoy Watch and you can see nuclear missiles, nuclear warheads being driven from Burfield down in England, by the road up to Fast Lane and Coolport. That's nuts. Now, if, if one of them, for whatever reason, was to be exploded, there wouldn't be like a, a nuclear f sort of meltdown as in, as in, as in a nuclear missile strike would be. But you would have a radioactive effect. You could, you could have a crater almost five miles wide. You would obliterate. If that was to happen, if you were to have a nuclear, if you were to have that, one of those convoy vehicles, if it was to explode, for example, on its way to Glasgow, you would wipe out the population of Scotland as far north as Perth and as far south as the north of England. And across the Edinburgh, you're talking about most of Scotland's population being wiped out and then having a Chernobyl-like effect, meaning that Scotland was a desolate wreck for hundreds of years. That's just utterly unacceptable. So for me to see so many powerful speeches getting talking about getting rid of, of, of nuclear weapons, but as importantly, putting in its place, because the, 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 the sea lock at Coolport and Fast Lane is very well suited for, that's where the submarines are there. It's a deep water base. And that is the place that an independent Scotland can have a, a, a military navy, and uh, our fisheries vessels, and you're talking about thousands of jobs. You're talking about job security for that area. You're talking about developing a conventional, uh, a conventional naval force. You're talking about ships being built. You're talking about Scotland as an independent Scotland, as part of the European Union, being able to have fisheries vessels which actually do their job. At the moment, as part of the UK, as far as I'm aware, there's only a couple of fisheries vessels patrolling. Scotland's got, Scotland's got a coastline, I didn't know this, but Scotland's coastline today, somebody said, is longer than that of India because of all the wee nooks and crannies we've got. It is significant to think an independent Scotland can get rid of nuclear weapons and create thousands of jobs on the Clyde is really powerful. So I, I'm, I'm buzzing. We've got, we've got democracy, we've got our brand, and we've got a positive nuclear-free future with well, lots of jobs. That's brilliant. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Hi, Chris Pekoska. It's nice to see you. We were together a couple of nights ago. <laughs> and now I've met you again at the <laughs> SMP conference. It's good to see you. And tell me, you, you've been at the uh, one of the fringe meetings with the... Uh, yes, the uh, I, uh, I'm a uh, member of the trade union executive. Uh, we had a fringe meeting uh, yesterday afternoon. 
uh, very well attended uh, and it was on the subject of corporate manslaughter. Uh, this was uh, done in conjunction with uh, Thompson Solicitors uh, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, uh, Chris Stevens MP is uh, definitely going to pursue through uh, Westminster uh, and hopefully uh, lay down a 10 minute rule bill on it. Okay, now just, just can you just give a, a little indication of what does that term mean, corporate manslaughter? Right, well, uh, we are, uh, you are looking at the fact that there have been um, multiple deaths uh, in the workplace. Uh, and uh, none of them have uh, came to a, a, a successful conviction. Uh, and that's down to the corporate companies uh, that are uh, uh, not willing to admit liability for their workers. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this has to stop. Yeah, because of course a corporation or a limited company is actually in law a person. So they're just as much liable as any ordinary person would be if they happen to cause the death of somebody. Yeah, but you're uh, quite correct in that assertion. Uh, and, and, and it's a bit like uh, these uh, corporate companies with their attitude towards uh, the, uh, uh, the avoidance of tax. Do you know what I mean? Because uh, when uh, uh, someone dies, uh, it's, not just the, it's not just the person You've got to think of the wider ramifications of it. Uh, so always you've got to think of the family. In fact, Jean Friedman said that in her speech this morning, didn't you? Right. Same, the same sentiment that the, 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 the violence doesn't do anybody any good. It just causes a lot of upset for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why uh, uh, large corporations want to avoid it because it's not just the, the uh, fact that people are seeking... Uh, compensation for uh, their uh, loved one because obviously I hate to point out the obvious but when someone dies through corporate manslaughter you know you have to think about the fact of that, that family has lost a wage as well as a beloved member of the family uh, you, you know what price do you put on that uh, and, and so if uh, corporations uh, are avoiding uh, 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 what they, what they uh, legally should do uh, and uh, more often than not it's down to the fact that uh, the, uh, the uh, bereaved families are not uh, properly informed uh, and uh, we have to uh, uh, find out uh, how we can change that for the better uh, because the Westminster government uh, are uh, keeping uh, this issue uh, under a kind of like a cloak and dagger uh, 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 sort of like episode because it, is, uh, it doesn't come under the competence of Scottish government uh, and they're putting it down to a reserve matter uh, and we have to try and find a different angle uh, the, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, legal body, which obviously Scots law is completely different to English law, uh, we can actually change this round without waiting for that competence to be devolved to us uh, and we can uh, hopefully affect change sooner rather than later because if we are waiting for the Westminster government, you know, we're going to be waiting a hell of a long time. Anyway, so that sounds like a, a rather big success for one of the fringe meetings. Yeah. So what about the rest of the conference? Have you managed to catch up on any of that? Any highlights that you'd like to point out? <coughs> uh, to be honest with you, uh, as, as I was saying to you off camera, uh, because the uh, Edinburgh uh, International Conference Centre, which we're sitting in just now, uh, I, uh, I find it a lot more uh, intimate venue uh, than the, the SEC or the the uh, AIC up in Aberdeen uh, and uh, I, I, it, it, it makes it more homely I think. <coughs> There's a jolly good atmosphere here anyway isn't there? It, and what, what do you think is causing that? Well obviously it's the buoyancy of uh, 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 Nicola's uh, statement which we discussed on Wednesday night uh, and uh, it's also the uh, reaction of Eden's uh, speech uh, just about uh, what, uh, half an hour before we came on air. 
uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, party are, I would say, quietly confident because I don't think that we ever want to come across as bullshit confident. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, finding the fine line between the two, uh, where we quietly and uh, in a dignified manner uh, just get on with the day job and also garner support for independence. Yeah, I think Michael Russell put that pretty well yesterday. We've come this far, still a few more stops to go along on this bus journey, but we, we're getting there. Yeah, 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 oh, 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 almost definitely. Uh, and uh, uh, coming back to the actual atmosphere of the uh, uh, conference, the way that this is actually laid out, uh, I think actually uh, bodes well uh, for the, uh, the uh, membership. Uh, because there's uh, uh, countless fringes, as we were talking about, uh, that you can get involved in, uh, as well as the the uh, exhibitors uh, downstairs as well. So it's very, very well laid out. Uh, and the way that they've done the sort of like reception hall that we're sitting in just now, uh, it's not, uh, it's not auspicious in any way you, you know you've got MPs you've got MSPs just wandering around cups of coffee in their hand so look just give us a, a, a little bit because you, you were talking about your refugees the other night just yes. give us a, a, a little bit of a fill-in for that well uh, the uh, Eastwood refugee aid uh, uh, who might uh, do humanitarian work for uh, we held a fundraiser uh, as I was telling you in the uh, 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 Maccabi Sports Centre in Gifnock and uh, we raised over a thousand pounds that we can take out to France and uh, to Belgium uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, continue to support our friends and care for Cali. Well that really sounds a great place to finish because it's a nice upbeat note. Thank you very much for your time. So Ian Black, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Voices, tell me all about Voices. So, um, we launched Voices for Scotland, the, the Scottish Independence Convention, a group of 20 uh, organisations, including the SNP, the Green Party, um, regional groups. We launched a new campaigning organisation called Voices for Scotland on Thursday. This is a, an organisation very much uh, aimed at having the conversations, listening to those people who haven't supported us uh, in the past and, uh, and need a little bit of maybe help and reassurance and confidence to support us in the future. So I'm trying to be very um, gentle with my language because I think that's the sort of conversations that we need to have with those people who are undecided but are interested and we would like to frame instead of framing people as no voters or unionists which puts people in a camp saying that we're yes and they're no puts people in camps so we would like to have conversations with people who support the union but maybe had their faith undermined a little bit in the last few uh, a few months who might be more interested now in thinking hang on a sec we have the, uh, I'd like to hear more, I'd like you to listen to me about what helped me understand and come to your, um, your, your side. So that's Vo uh, Voices for Scotland, we have a website, we are we're looking for, obviously always looking for donations, um, we have our, our um, uh, social media and I'm very, and we were delighted to have some time at the SNP conference today to, to an, uh, announce the organisation. Well, I think it's a good thing to give you some time <laughs> and, and uh, I do think it's very important that the thing about the it's the thing I often say, we, we've, we've split society down the middle in so many ways and there's no way we can continue to go on like that. We've got to find ways to draw, draw people back together. And you, you had Elaine C. Smith with you the other day? Uh, yes, yeah, so Elaine is the is the chair of the the, the board of uh, Voices for Scotland, the chair of the SIC. So she obviously does the uh, the front of house and does the the, the, the showbiz excitement. So she launched um, um, on on Thursday. We also had um, six voices from different parts. We had um, Ashley Grychek, who was an, uh, a Conservative councillor, who once, I think once she started looking around a little bit more broadly about what conservatism was doing to the to the UK. She moved uh, to become an independent councillor in Edinburgh maybe about six months ago. So um, she's also profoundly deaf. So to, to, to hear her voice, it's a little really, and that's that's kind of what we, we had uh, people from business, we had uh, people from other disability uh, groups, um, to say, imagine what their Scotland 
would, would, would need to be like not this five percent better than Westminster version, but what what are the profound changes that we, we, we need to do? But also having a conversation in a different tone, no professional slick politician presentation, um, uh, entertainment, no politicians on the on, on the panel, and we uh, and we hope to be open and respectful in the way that we speak to people. So, how can people get involved with you? So I think in the, in the first instance we have a, a beautifully put together website from the company, a Glaswegian company, uh, who, who designed the work for People Make Glasgow and the Commonwealth Games. So there's a website, voicesforscotland.scot. Um, we have the, the user Twitter and, uh, uh, and Facebook uh, and Instagram, which again are Voices for Scotland. Um, and all, all people are going to do is look up Voices for Scotland on their computers. And, they, and is there a, a location where they can you know, come to you? Is there a building or anything? Um, we have one employee at the moment, uh, Chris Hegarty has joined us as our coordinator, we're looking to employ more people. Um, if people want to provide their, their, their contact details, if they want to get in touch with their local um, independence movement group, the local SNP, the local Green Party and say we're more than happy to come along and talk to them about what it is dis and discuss how this might work in their particular area. Well, that's fantastic, thank you very much Ian. Ian Black from Voices for Scotland. So, Michael Russell, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to oh, us. At, <laughs> that's very kind of you. I didn't put the microphone yeah, in front no of your way. mouth then. I can so, be <laughs> now, I, I, I listened to your speech yesterday. It was absolutely wonderful. I think probably the, 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 the things to talk about, first of all, is independence and then maybe a little bit about the, the big issue of yesterday. Yeah. And, and maybe you could just give us a little bit of a rundown. I think uh, that would be interesting. No. Well, on the independence issue, I mean, quite clearly, things moved on a stage this week with the First Minister's statement in the Scottish Parliament on Wednesday. A lot of time and effort and thought has gone into what the right next moves are. Uh, it, it, uh, the Brexit process has delayed that because I think it is absolutely clear and Nicola is 100% correct to say that people need to know what the choice would be. But I think we're getting closer to that stage and therefore we need to put the preparations in place that will allow us to move forward and in two ways. The first of which is to have the technical preparations in place and that's why we're bringing forward a referendums bill. Uh, it doesn't allow us to have a, a referendum on independence because that's a matter subject to section 30 of the Scotland Act, but it does create the framework for holding a referendum and what we did in 2014 was the opposite. We waited till we got the section 30 order and then did the legislation. This time that legislation will last forever essentially, it'll allow referendums to take place and we could slot in a section 30 order of a simply to that. But the second and perhaps less geeky part of this, so it's very important to do it, uh, is to say how do we br debate this and bring it to the right place in Scotland? How do we learn the big lesson of Brexit? There's nothing good really has come of Brexit and I don't think anything could, but uh, there are some lessons to be learned and one of them is the divisiveness of the way in which the process has taken place. Over almost three years, Theresa May behaved from the beginning as if uh, you know, 51, 52% was everything and 48% was nothing. And that's the wrong way to do it. And we need to sit down and listen to everybody in Scotland who's got an opinion about how we should move forward as a nation. Many of them wish independence. Some of them don't want any change at all. Some want a variety of different bits of change. So there's two strands to that. The first strand is to talk to the parties and to, I think, to Civic Scotland, I think, too. I think that's interesting how that's developed in the last few days, uh, organizations wanting to be part of it, um, on a, a respectful basis in which we listen to what people's views are and we see if there's common ground on how the, the, the present constitutional settlement could change. And even if that doesn't embrace independence, it means that on the journey to independence, which we are on, we could make some changes as we go along, because that's necessary. The present system is utterly broken, and it's not working for anybody. But the second... But Michael, yeah. what, what I find when I go around and um, talk to people, I do every day, I, I'll, I'll stop anybody in the street or in the supermarket, and that information that a lot of normal people have about all the issues that you and I yeah. think of constantly is not always available at their fingertips and I think it should be. There was a, a group of young people here yesterday saying about a toolkit for their lives. How can we improve the general education of, of the politics? Well, that brings me to the second part of the preparations uh, which is the citizens assembly. Brexit has taught us that you shouldn't polarize debates, you should try and bring people together. And one of the issues also people want to know is the information you're talking about. How can you come to a judgment? 
So the Citizens Assembly, as we develop it, will, I think, look at the big issues, think about the big issues, but will, I'm absolutely certain, say, we need more on that, we need more on this. Uh, you know, give us some unbiased, how do you get the unbiased opinion? How can you come to a judgment? So alongside an increase in information and independence, we will be listening to and talking with the people of Scotland. I'm really enthused by the Citizens Assembly idea. I was delighted at the conference here today, backed it, I think, unanimously as, as a way forward. I will now put flesh in those bones. So over the next period, over the next uh, six months to a year, there will be an increase in information, there will be an increase in debate, and it will be on Scotland's terms, on the terms of the people of Scotland, and they will influence that. That's absolutely super. Have you got anything else you'd like to put forward to no, us? No, I mean, I just, I just think that in, you know, the independence cause I've been lived with for 45 years, as I said in my speech yesterday. Uh, I think it is growing and strengthening, but it has to be won in a generous, open, inclusive way, and that's what I'm committed to in my role as Constitutional Secretary. Well, thank you very much for giving us your time. Here we are at the 2019 SNP conference. What do you think so far? I love it. The, the energy and the motivation and the excitement around the place is just fantastic. And um, I mean, these, these events are great for the wider membership to get together. And I hope everybody realizes how accessible and down to earth and, you know, we're all Jock Thompson's bairns. You actually get to talk to ministers and, and then also you're heavily involved in policy. And, you know, let's not forget that's unusual in today's political parties. So I found the whole two days massively motivating. In fact, there was a really feisty debate yesterday, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there, there was a feisty side to it, but at the same time, actually, isn't it great that we're talking about that substance? We're talking about what country, kind of country we want to be and how we best achieve that. Um, and that's just the beginning, you know, we get our independence and suddenly all these levers are open and think of the debates we can have in future about really making a difference. So, yeah, so a wee, a wee bit, a wee bit of differing of opinion, but not, I don't think not that much. And actually, great we can have the debate and I look forward to much more. Yeah, of course, you see, they, 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 the mainstream always concentrate on that silly little issue of currency when we've had 23 currencies, I think, in Scotland already. So what does it matter if we have another one? But um, that issue yesterday was quite interesting, wasn't it? Where you, we, we had the, 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 the debate about that and it, was, it came down to the currency and shall we have it directly as we get independence or, or otherwise? What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I, I think we all know in 2014 the currency became a major issue. And we had a challenge around the other side being able to say, no matter, I always thought it was a phenomenally disingenuous, dishonest line they came out with, but it was effective. You can't have it. And it worked for people. So what, what we come up with now, there's, there's more than one way to do it. As you say, there's lots of options. And I've always thought it's the democratic arguments, the most important thing. We will make our own decisions. But we still have to have a prospectus to put out there because there is an expectation of a level of detail. I don't think we should, ex we should expect to have all the answers. In fact, we absolutely shouldn't try to have all the answers because that's the pushing down into the weeds that they did effectively. But we need enough to show that we've thought about it, that we've got the competence, and to start to show people, look, we really could do so much with the right levers and the right control. So I, I love it. As you can tell, I'm quite excited about it. I think it's, no, it's, I think it's an interesting thing, money, because it's an invention of mankind, like so many other things that we think are real, but actually it's only in our minds that it really exists. And I, I, I've, I think I might just toy, tease you with this question. I mean, what about, I mean, there is so much debt in every single country. It seems to me there's no way out of that uh, because I, I can't think anyone's going to live long enough to pay it all off. I mean, do you think we might score a line under it? Because th this was part of the issue yesterday, wasn't it? Some people wanted to score a line under it and start the country off with no debt at all, but others were willing to pay into the sort of wider fund because we'd been involved with the UK for so long. Yeah, so... Um couple of things. First of all, the point that your, your starting point about uh, currency and the artificial invention, so are political parties. You know, if you look back at the formation of the United States, um, they didn't want parties because parties could become too much the focus. And we see that in the UK where it's all about the Tories and self-preservation. But actually parties are about bringing people with shared passion together to be more effective. 
and there's no better example in politics, I think, than the SNP. In terms of your core point about debt, that is a heavy issue in many respects, partly because of the sheer scale and the numbers involved. Partly, of course, because we look at the situation we're in and the false numbers that are attributed as part of the UK to create this impression of us being a bankrupt, um, incapable of being an independent country, which is, again, a completely false perspective, a false narrative. And too often, I think, these things get simplified. If you look at the way the Tories and others treat it, they talk about the uh, money flow like a household budget. But we all know it's a totally false comparison. And I think it's great that we have a debate where we're actually going into monetary theory. We can't do that on the doorstep. But isn't it great we can start to discuss these issues and discuss debt and how much we should have, discuss currencies, discuss the levers of power and control that we could have if we go one way or another. So I'm no expert on it, but I, I think it's fantastic that we're able to have this debate and consider the options. You see, numbers are quite easy, really, aren't they? I mean, you just add one to one and you get two, or you have zero and one, or you can have everything in the world because that's computer code. But if you, if you, if you just distill everything down to numbers and you say, uh, well, if we just reduce this budget by 10%, the other end of that coin, uh, the, that, 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 I don't know, that line is that 550,000 people lose their benefit. Yeah, so um, I think... Uh that's all about who's making the decisions, isn't it? It comes back to the democratic argument of why we need full control. And, you know, you, you get, um, look at Borders Council, right? So Borders Council have just taken a decision to give every high school student an iPad. It's going to cost 16 million over 10 years. At the same time, they have cut the budget to Citizens Advice, and I'm the chair, independent chair of Citizens Advice in the Borders. 19,000 pounds is a lot of money to us. But they made a priority decision to give every child an iPad, I think that's a whole debate in itself, and then cut. So yes, they, they made a priority call. That's why we need independence though. And I think, you know, my, my son, excuse this if this is slightly too long, but my son, son has just got into hill walking with me. And we're still, we're, he's done a couple of Corbett's, we're gonna do him in row, and he's learning to map me. And I'm saying, son, listen, a small degree of difference doesn't look very much but over time it's a massive difference and that's to me what's happening increasingly in the UK a small degree of difference is going to take us to very different paths and that's what um, we hope we can convey to people out here there is no status quo anymore the UK is on a path we would like to go on a very different path but we need independence yeah. I think uh, that's a good place to, to, to finish our conversation so Philippa You've been uh, speaking today uh, in one of the uh, uh, motions downstairs in the conference room. Please tell us about that. Well, it was a resolution highlighting the issue of the fact that universal credit is only paid into one bank account per household and the fact that that can put the power into a controlling partner's hands. Now, it isn't just women who suffer financial control or abuse, but it's predominantly women. And actually, financial abuse can affect one in five women at some point in their lifetime. Now, I've been raising this for about two years with the UK government, and the response is always, oh, well, women could request separate payments as individuals. But there's work from Women's Aid where their survey showed 85% of survivors wouldn't dare do that because it could attract actually more abuse and more violence. So my case is that actually every individual should have their own money, should have respect. If they choose as a partnership to, to do something different with it, that's fine. But it's not for the state to be actually parceling up the money and putting it in the hands of one person. And so how, I'm sorry, I had to come out of the room and so I didn't hear the result. Did they, was, it, was it passed? Yes, it was passed by acclaim, so just on, on, the, um, on the applause. I mean, the, the main challenge is to the UK government, which controls universal credit. The Scottish government, I really welcome, support the principle of individual payments, but obviously they always have to work with the DWP, which literally is like having an elephant on your back. So my challenge to them is to not give up. To yeah. keep doing it. The, this is an issue that's been floating around the, the ether for a little while, and I've heard 
several commentators, uh, I mean, they were, they were saying, oh, make devolution work and do this and do that. And then they cited the welfare payments. Now, I have an understanding of that. I don't know if everybody who's watching us will have a, a clear understanding, but I'm sure you can give us a, a clear a clearer understanding of why certain of the benefits we've actually decided not to bring up from the south? Well actually there was only one benefit that uh, wasn't being taken that was offered and that's because it's actually an old benefit that's disappearing so it didn't make sense to be setting up a whole system for a benefit that actually fewer than 2,000 people receive. So the other benefits we are taking but it's only 15% of social security that's being devolved. Um, the big one that Scotland will control is PIP, personal independence payments. And again, the problem is working with the DWP. If you're starting with a blank sheet of paper, you can design something that's quite sleek and straightforward and integrates. When you always have to beg for the DWP to do something and fight for it, it that's what takes the time. Now with PIP, uh, one of the big changes is work capability assessments will not be carried out by private companies like Atos. Um, they will be carried out by public servants. If someone clearly in their medical records has an incurable condition that isn't going to improve, they're not going to be assessed and assessed and assessed, which is what happens now. They say it's about saving money, but they're wasting so much money in the administration, in these kind of repeat assessments, and so many people haven't got the medical evidence at the beginning, but when the medical evidence comes either at mandatory reconsideration or appeal, their decision is overturned. So the Scottish Government wants to start with the medical evidence and actually only bring people in for a face-to-face -face assessment where you can see that there's some justification for doing that. And the great thing is they've designed the system talking to people who are users of the system and therefore the whole point is to put support and dignity at the centre of it. Well that sounds a, a much better thing. And Let's move to the wider thing of the conference. How, how are you enjoying that and what's the highlight for you so far? Well, I always enjoy conference, um, you know, spending half my week in London, um, you know, living in exile as it sometimes feels, certainly living away from my family. There's always just such a brilliant atmosphere at conference. It's so friendly. Um, I, it's like plugging yourself into the mains and recharging your batteries. The only problem is I always find it difficult to get from A to B because I end up chatting to so many people. Um, it's me taking all your time as well. Not at all, <laughs> but, but I do on, love... Just give us a little bit... Give us a little bit of the insider stuff from the, from the, 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 the Westminster Chamber. What's it like there? Hellish. <laughs> I mean, it used to be that, you know, people would kind of say, how are you doing? And you say, fine. Then you move to as well as can be expected. And just before we got the break at Easter, you, you end up just going, hmm, because, frankly, words just didn't cover how, how awful it's been. You see... Give a Hochstadt, he said, look, we've just given you a, a, a great big extension till October. And what have you done? You've just gone on holiday. What did you think about that? Well, to be honest, um, having no break at all. And people have to remember when, when we end up sitting Thursdays and Fridays, then the constituency work moves into the weekends. Uh, MPs lost family holidays and things over this spring. And to be honest, between death threats, late night sittings, the tension of it, Lots of MPs were speaking to me about either their mental or physical health. And I think people needed a break. They needed the chance to step back. But my bigger concern is they've given a long extension, which means there's the opportunity for the UK government to actually step back from this and reconsider and either look to find a compromise way forward, such as was offered by the Scottish government in December 16 of staying in the single market and customs union, or to consider a second referendum. But I think what Theresa May will do is actually fritter it away in lots of little deadlines. Oh, can we do something by the 22nd of May? No. Can we do something by the 30th of June? then a recess and then just fritter fritter and we'll be at the 31st of October. But do you no think there's, do you think there's actually any hope at all of changing her mind to do anything other than what she's fixed in a, in a, in a heat? I think she's quite a rigid fixated person. I think there were lots of things. I mean, even if she had accepted a 
second referendum on her deal would have been a way out for her. Obviously, she's in talks with Labour, which don't sound to be going anywhere. Lots of groups, and I'm part of one of the big cross-party groups that have been trying to work on this since last autumn. Um, people go and visit her and say, look, this might work or that might work, and it's like she just doesn't listen. So I don't think she's actually got the, the kind of flexibility uh, mentally to be willing to step back and listen to people. I don't think she's a listener. Well, look, Philippa, thank you very much for giving us all your time. Lovely to see you join. Lovely how, to see you too. How have you found conference? My pal, from, my pal from Parliament, and here we are back together again. Well, it's a great conference, but of course I'm here as a journalist this mm -hmm. time. I'm with Talk Radio, so we're doing a, a show live from, from conference. So I'm, I'm parked downstairs, and I'm like you going around picking folk to, uh, to interview, and I've got to talk about them rather than us mm -hmm. uh, as a journalist. So I've got to get the grammar right, because uh, one of the things I found hard when I was elected to Parliament as a journalist was to start saying we because you know you're so trained to be uh, objective um, and I'm, uh, I'm back in that role again. So how have you found the, the buzz of the place this weekend? Well I think the fact there was this series of polls that came out, extraordinary polls that show that the uh, SNP would take 50 seats at a Westminster election, that we'd win the Scottish elections again and crucially that fantastic poll that showed that we're neck and neck on the question of independence has created this amazing buzz and like you I've been coming to SNP conferences for a long time. Do you know the thing that I notice and I don't know if this is age getting the better of me or not it just is a lot of young people here uh, you know, huge numbers of young uh, of young people and I just get the sense of uh, dynamism and excitement and I think, those, I think those polls have energised the whole conference. And it's taken a wee while, I think, for people to focus on Brexit, the results of Brexit, the effect of Brexit on Scotland, and for that to translate into support for the SNP and independence. Because we face a choice, don't we? Do we want, as a country, to be part of a Boris Johnson Brexit Britain, or do we want to be a dynamic, successful, small European country in the European Union, like our near neighbours, Denmark, Ireland and Finland? I know which way I want the country to vote, and I think people are focusing on that now. There's been lots of mention about the energy of this weekend, and I think in, in some ways it's been quite refreshing because every other discussion or topic is always Brexit, 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 and actually Brexit's been quite dwarfed this time in terms of what we've, they've been speaking about, about you know the, um, the speeches, the resolutions, the amendments. There's like a different energy, and they're obviously focusing on independence, but, but it just seems that there's been a, a different energy this time. I think that's true, and Brexit is just so depressing. It saps energy, doesn't it? Because it, 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 it's such a backward-looking debate, the idea that we withdraw back into these islands, that we stop freedom of movement, that we limit young people's opportunities. It just, it just makes me feel sad, everything to do uh, with Brexit. When I think of the opportunities I had as a young person to travel freely around the, Euro the European Union, to work in different countries, why should this generation not have the same opportunities uh, and I, I think uh, Brexit has sapped the energy out of English politics and thank goodness we we have this safety net don't we we've got a parachute and a safety net we can we can jump as we find ourselves hurtling towards the the Brexit cliff and we can do something different do something with ambition and energy and I think if Brexit has taught us anything positive it's taught us this that the power of small independent countries within the European Union, backed by the other 27, is quite extraordinary. I mean, I remember the arrogance of the Tory government when they were talking about how they were, what they were going to do with Ireland and how they were going to put Ireland back in its box. It's not the way it worked out, has it? What we found is that Ireland, backed by the 27 to the hilt, has punched way above its weight. And who could really seriously say? looking at Scotland's position within the United Kingdom and Ireland's position within the European Union, that uh, Ireland is in a disadvantaged position compared with Scotland, we've got no say. I mean, I've just interviewed Mike Russell and he was telling me just exactly what the negotiations were like with uh, Theresa May. Ireland's not in that position. Ireland has the Chancellor of Germany flying into Dublin 
for consultations about what help she can give them. That's where Scotland should be. And finally, John, is there any speeches or resolutions or amendments that have really stood out for you this weekend? Well, I, uh, I'm interested in foreign affairs, and one of the things I always say to people when they say, why is it that you want Scotland to be independent? And it is because I want Scotland, amongst all the other advantages, to play a meaningful role on the international stage and to be a force for peace and liberalism and, uh, and uh, our kind of progressive values. And I was enormously touched by the speeches that we heard, both about Sri Lanka and also the speech that Ian Blackford gave about Northern Ireland. The idea that we're having a journalist murdered uh, today in Northern Ireland is such a depressing state of affairs. And I thought Ian gave a very moving speech about that. And uh, for anybody who says that uh, independence is all about thinking about yourself, you only have to look at the delegates downstairs, see how engaged they are about uh, the international community and how hungry they are to play a more meaningful role. That was absolutely clear in the international debates. Lovely, thanks very much for thanks joining us, John, and good luck with the show tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So how have you found conference this weekend? This has been a great conference, actually. Really interesting debates. Obviously, the Growth Commission debate yesterday, but also uh, I had a motion in on uh, protected geographical indications, which I did with Emma Harper, and, and that's been really well received as well. I don't think people realise just how important it is to our producers uh, and to our consumers as well in Scotland. So you mentioned geographical indicators. Um, can you tell us a bit more about why that's so important? Well, geographical indications um, are protected characteristics that it's a scheme that's been was introduced by uh, through uh, Europe, the EU. And the problem is that the UK government, rather than asking for those protections just to be extended to UK products and for it to continue within that scheme, have decided to set up their own new scheme. We've not really got any details yet, um, but given that the US, for example, which is the um, sort of favourite unicorn uh, trade deal of the Brexiters doesn't like PGIs. Um, we think there's potentially a big problem there. Uh, I, do I think that some of the trade negotiators that go into that would be wouldn't be prepared to sacrifice PGIs uh, in the face of US intransigence? And they've already signalled they don't like it. Um, no, I don't. So. Um, you know, the PGIs themselves are really important partly for Scotland in particular, I think, because so many of them are rooted in um, rural or very small communities um, and uh, they can't, you know, they can't be from anywhere else. Arbro Smokies can't be produced in a Spanish fishing town, for example. Um, and so therefore, you know, areas that are, you could describe as a bit more precarious in terms of population, you know, depopulation potential and so on, um, and, and, and there just isn't the, there aren't the jobs in that area that y y could enable the, the, the whole thing to slip um, slip away. Uh, th th this makes it really crucial for, for those areas in particular. Um, but just more widely, I mean, they cover things like Scotch beef and Scotch lamb. These are in tremendously important exports to Scotland. Um, Scotch whisky, of course, which is the biggest drink export in, in the whole of the United Kingdom, let alone Scotland. So. You know, these are important, so I was really pleased that I was able to bring the motion to conference with Emma uh, Harper, MSP, and, uh, and, and, and just raise awareness of, of its importance. That's great, Deirdre. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Hi, Jim. How have you found the conference this weekend? I found it absolutely fantastic this weekend. Encouraging, loving. You could feel that family atmosphere. Everybody there together, the same views, the dynamics, all heading the same way with that vision, ultimately, independently been that independent nation. So what would you say of the whole weekend? What, would, what, did, what interested you the most in terms of the speeches or the resolutions? What kind of stood out for you? I, I think what did stand out was, although the press made highly what I says was that encouraging, again for grassroots, own that decision about how we're going to work with the economy, going back to the floor and coming back and making that small change. It wasn't a massive change, although the media would like to make it a wee bit bigger than it actually was, that they listened to the grassroots, so that's basically what it would come out, stuck out a mile for me this time. And what will you take back to your ward? Take back to my ward, obviously this courage, the, the, the hype that comes for a movement like this, like the SNP, is to ultimately be that independent nation and talking to the folk. There's not just on the verge of being swayed to sell to vote yes but also the people that are deeper rooted in that know and convince them as well great thanks for joining us jim thank you very much um, how have you found the conference this weekend 
It is most fantastic things I've done for, for many, many years. Uh, you know, I come from the country when, uh, at the moment, we have a problem with the government. Uh, SNP is the party which I joined because I just believe in the ways of this country is governed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, today, uh, you know, speech of uh, of our First Minister, it was amazing. She is, I, I admire her for many, many, many years. But today she set up something which, uh, me as a, as a socialist, I always was hoping that the government of this kind is going to put forward. It was absolutely amazing and fantastic, and I'm, I'm absolutely privileged that I've been chosen by my branch of the um, SNP to, uh, to be a delegate. So I hope that I'm going to be the delegate next year and for many, many years to come, and I'm going to support uh, independence as much as I can, as I used to do in the previous uh, referendum. I just believe that now uh, we have to think a little bit different way. You know, those days I was thinking about the Polish community to vote for independence. Unfortunately, I have to admit that I failed those days because a lot of Poles voted uh, against independence. And now a lot of them, they are coming back to me and just saying, you know, Tomek, you were right. We were absolutely wrong. So I just believe that all the EU citizens who are living in this country, we have to get together and we have to fight for Scottish independence because Scotland is as much as our country, as our native country is. So hopefully we are going to be independent Scottish, independent Polish Scottish, independent any EU citizen Scottish in this country. Was there anything else that you took away from the conference? Any particular speeches or resolutions or amendments that stood out for you? I just, you know, I just believe that economy is the most important thing. And, uh, you know, in the previous uh, referendum, we had the gaps in the, in, in the economy. Uh, how to present future economy of Scotland. I believe that now is much, much clearer and much more, much more precise. And I, I have to say that uh, I was voting for the uh, D amendment. Uh, and I believe that this, uh, but the rest is absolutely fantastic. So uh, now, uh, most important thing is uh, as well that uh, as uh, Nicola said today, that if we are going to put these uh, notions, all economic and, and future, uh, into all, all households in Scotland, that I believe that uh, we are going to win without problem this time. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Brian Miles, I know that last year Nicola Sturgeon followed you um, after, so you were very famous at that last conference. But we, you were discussing with me off the camera a few minutes ago about the euro and the currency that was uh, debated yesterday, and you had a, a view upon it. So let expound that to us. Yes. Um, my view is if we are going to go independent, we want to stay in Europe, it would, to keep the euro would give a big yes Europe we're here we're supporting you let us in and I and I, I truly believe our currency should be the euro because we wish to stay in the European Union and we'll be better off in the European Union our, our science our industry can flow our education our universities can go forward in to the common market and, and what would you it. Brian what would you say to the folk who are not so keen upon that idea because of course currency is a rather emotional issue for a lot of people yes but if you think of one thing that we call it in this country the sterling maybe we should make the sterling cast or limited country and say that is our hallmark you can't use it England 
Well, of course, Sterling Castle sits up there on the hill, yeah. <laughs> yes, but I, I think it would be a, a prudent move. It would send the right message to Europe that we are serious, we want to join them, we want to stay with them, we want to be in their umbrella of defence. Thank you very much. We're joined now by Margaret Ferrier. How have you found the conference, Margaret? Oh, it's really been inspiring and I think everybody's really enjoyed the messaging that uh, has come from Nicola there. Everybody's buoyed up and ready to get out, hopefully on to doors. We've got EU elections coming up on the 23rd. If there isn't a deal done by the 22nd of May, the elections will take place and it would be nice to find you know, a large amount of people going out. And obviously you're one of the SNP candidates for the EU election, how are you feeling about that? I'm feeling really, really honoured that I'm one of the final six candidates. Um, I mean, I think it will be a tall order um, to get, you know, all six of us elected. Definitely, we're normally only able to get two, but I think, you know, we're on, we're on good, you know, a good footing to try and get more than two elected this time. And I think it's important that Scotland's future that does lie in Europe, and we need to make our voice heard in the SNP because. That, that you know the remain vote was so high and it's probably increased since the last time so you know we need everybody to get out and work really hard over the next few weeks to return as many of us as possible into, into Brussels. And obviously apart from the obvious Nicholas speech what else has stood out for you this weekend in terms of speeches or resolutions or amendments is there anything particular? I think obviously there was a lot of debate around the Sustainable Growth Commission and uh, you know it was accepted by all the delegates with, with an amendment and you know our, our party's really good at that, being able to debate things without falling out about it and I think that's really stood out that, that you know the general resolution was accepted with just that amendment that came in um, and the other thing that's really stood out there and, and what Nicola said was about you know the money that, that she's they're going to provide from the government for first time buyers to get onto the housing ladder. That was a big, big announcement today um, and, and I think it really went down well with the delegates. Right. That's great, Margaret. Thanks for talking to us and good luck with the campaign. Thank you very much. Keith, how have you found the conference this weekend? I think it's been a great conference. I mean, you wouldn't see in any other party, either in Scotland or the UK, a conference as well attended with real vibrant debates, real votes and the membership of the party. So that on top of some excellent poll ratings have given a real lift and it's been a tremendous conference. Well, what has stood out for you in terms of maybe speeches or amendments or resolution? What's been kind of really sparked your interest? I think we've had a great range of resolutions. I proposed one myself on pension credits, which I was pleased past. It's some great resolutions, but I think some of the announcements from the First Minister are really important. So some of the help for first-time buyers is extremely important. Uh, declaring a climate emergency, again, well ahead of the other parties. And also declaring her intentions in terms of the independence referendum preparations. You saw there were spontaneous standing ovations for each of those announcements, and I think that really was uh, the highlight of the conference for me. I think it's been refreshing as well in terms of every other talk or, or show or, or anything has been about Brexit, 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 which is just depression. Whereas this last two days, it seems to, I mean, although Brexit has been mentioned the odd occasion, it's been dwarfed by the fact of that there, there is another option for Scotland. Do you get the same kind of feeling? Definitely, and as you say, the breadth of the motions that were considered, so on domestic violence, on pension entitlements, on the environment, you saw that fact that the SNP government is concentrating on the day job, all the different issues that government involves and not just on Brexit. And you see the party as well thinking about these things, putting forward resolutions, coming up with some fantastic debates. The gig economy debate I listened to I thought was great as well. The de debate about the menopause, I think these are great issues which sometimes it's only the SNP that are talking about and taking these things forward but it, it reaffirms your faith in the party each time when you see the variety and the vibrancy that there is within the SNP. And finally, what are you taking away from the conference this weekend? We've got some work to do. So as the First Minister said, we intend to deliver a, a copy of our economic case for independent Scotland to every household in Scotland. We've got European elections coming up very shortly. We've seen some superb poll results interesting the Tories for the first time in a long time in single figures. Uh, but what that means is we've got a real challenge in a very odd European election to get out there and get people out and vote and tell them why it's important to vote to have Scotland's voice in Europe heard. Great, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon, Keith, thank you. Hi, Alan, how have you found conference this weekend? 
Oh, it's the usual. It's it's a far, it's part family gathering. It's part political meeting. It's part endurance test. My throat can just about bear bear testament to the fact that I've been doing a lot of chatting. It's, it, people forget about the SNP. We're a family. Yeah, we're, we're a family that sees, sees each other through the ups and downs and the good times, and we're going through a good time at the moment. And much as Brexit is a challenge, we're good for it. And we see people, friends from the length and breadth, up and down in east and west of the country. It's, conference is great, and we're in, we're in good hearts. It's not to say we don't have challenges. Brexit remains a hugely uh, unstable thing, but we're good for it, and we're up for it. So is there any particular is sort of like stuck out this weekend in terms of the speeches or the resolutions or whatever? Is there anything kind of really interested you? Well, Nicola's speech today was just pitch perfect. It, it was... We are fighting for Scotland in the world, we're fighting for Scotland within the UK in terms of making sure we maximise our interests and make Scotland's voice heard on the Brexit process as it rumbles forward, but also getting on with the job and getting on with the job in helping people access housing, getting on with the job in terms of building affordable houses, getting on with the job in terms of cracking down on Airbnb and making sure that yeah, we need to support tourism, sure, but houses are for living in. So we've got uh, strength and depth, and it's just been a great team uh, to, to be part of. Uh, it, conferences, it's, it's been really successful. And obviously we've got the EU elections, and you're one of the candidates going forward. How are you feeling about the elections? Well, I now think they're going to happen, which is, which is progress. <laughs> we, were, we were thinking of getting t-shirts made that I survived the 29th of March, I survived the 12th of April, bring on Halloween. It, it is, we've been dealing with such a chaotic process, and it's been tough. I mean, me and my guys... Uh, we've been made redundant twice in the past couple of weeks. That's been rough, but it's testament to the fact that we're all still fighting it that there is an argument to be won. And we're dealing with a government that claims to be in charge of events, but is so totally not in charge of events. I think the fact that the European elections are now happening, we can change the weather on what happens with Brexit subsequent to those elections. So it's there for us to win. The party's doing well in the polls, but polls don't count, votes count. And I think we've agitated the party and activate, activated the, the, the activist base of the party to get out there and win it. So I, I feel very positive. I mean, bring it on. The, the, we have a united policy, a clear, articulate policy in terms of what we want to see. Labour's hopelessly split. The Tories are hopelessly split. The Tories are trying to defend Brexit to a Scottish audience that rejected Brexit. I, I think we've got a, a, a good set of opportunities in front of us. And what is the feeling in Europe towards Scotland? Hugely positive. Uh, there's been a, a, a total inversion in terms of attitudes to us since 2014, where a lot of people, and we need to be, to be realistic about it, a lot of people didn't get why we wanted independence, didn't quite get why we were sceptical towards Westminster. They get it now, and we've got goodwill in spades, and nobody's going to get into our internal business. I don't want anybody from anywhere else getting into Scotland's debate, for us or against us, either way. But I think once we actually get things moving domestically, there's a huge interest in what we're up to and I think there's a, a, a massive opportunity for us. I think there's been a train of thought that up until 2014 Scotland was viewed internationally through Westminster's eyes but that seems to have changed over the last few years, would you say that was accurate? In part, I mean, in part, I mean there's, there's no question we are still represented internationally via the UK. Uh, and that doesn't, I believe, represent our interests in the best way that they could. So they're, they're doing this global Britain is great stuff while actually what they're talking about is cozying up to dictators to sell them guns and tanks and bombs. And I think Scotland could do better. We could do something different. Within the EU, there's a keen awareness because of Brexit about where Scotland is and what we want. And a lot of that has been behind the scenes because it has to be. Because the other member states will deal with the UK as our representative. But the second Brexit happens, if it happens, that changes. And we need to be ready for that Brexit flip. If we get there, we need to stop Brexit happening, but we need to be realistic about what our chances of that are, and we're covering all eventualities. I want to stop Brexit for the whole of the UK, I want to stop Brexit for Scotland, but we're also preparing the ground for an independence referendum as well. So it's hugely exciting. That's great, Alan. Thanks very much, and good luck with the campaign. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. So, Juliet Mann, you are the person who's come all the way from London, from the London SMP branch. I am. One so, of them. One of them. There are several of us here. And how many members have you got in your London branch? I think there are several hundred in name. They don't all come to meetings. We usually have maybe up to 60 or 70 at a time for a meeting. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. And, and, and how did you get involved with that? I had just happened to be in Scotland at the time of the referendum and watched it 
on the hotel television and I was gutted that we didn't get independence. So I went straight back to London and joined the SNP. And I don't know if many people would know that there is a, a branch of the SNP in London. Are there branches other places? There are two branches outside Scotland, one in London and one in Brussels, I believe. Oh. And uh, what motivated you? I mean, um, did you have a, 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 a disjunction with the Westminster politics? Or, or I mean, w w why don't you just deal with uh, parties that are down in England? Well, to start with, I once went past Westminster and looked at the building and wondered how the people in there could possibly know what people in Scotland wanted and needed. That was a long time ago, but now my MP is Jeremy Corbyn, and uh, the SNP is brilliant. So nothing more to say then on that particular score. <laughs> well, I think that's absolutely marvellous that you've, you've come all this way. How many conferences have you been to? I've been to two a year since 2014, but not last year because I was unwell. Okay. And who? I, I think that you, you, you do like to see the politicians. Who's your, who's your favourite? Oh, my word. Um, I don't know that I could answer that without thinking about it. Also, you wouldn't want to get into trouble, I suppose. No, no. Um, I, I like meeting the ones in London, and I think they, they're wonderful, uh, what they put up with in Parliament and in the Commons. Yeah, they're all... Ian Blackford's done really well in the last year, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Kirsty Freeman and Joanna Cherry, wonderful. Myrie Blackman, a black, yeah, lovely. Yes. So thank you very much. For